Welcome to Bed Crime Stories Podcast. I'm your host, T. Hope you guys are all doing well. Let me ask you a favor. If after listening to this video or watching it, you find you enjoyed it or learned something, do me a favor, hit that like button, consider subscribing, and leave me a message. Now, let's dig in. By now, we all know that 28-year-old Brian Christopher Koberger, or BK, or BCK, as I will now call him, was arrested on a warrant for four counts of first-degree blank, as well as felony burglary, and he now sits behind bars in his home state of Pennsylvania, where he's being held without bail. The Moscow police, the Idaho State Police, and the FBI are in agreement that they believe he's the person who viciously attacked the four students as they slept in an off-campus house in Moscow, Idaho. Moscow Police Chief James Fry said this to ABC News on Saturday. We believe we have our guy, the one who committed these red rums, end quote. He didn't say red rums. But YouTube doesn't like that word, so just spell it backwards and know that it starts with an M. So by that, Fry is saying that the authorities believe BK acted alone. Thus, in the end, if we choose at this time to believe Brian Koberger is responsible for this grotesque slaughter, he is innocent until proven guilty, after all. Then it is not the work of an enraged ex-boyfriend or any of the young guys who looked suspicious, but rather the man with his head on the chopping block is someone who appears to have all the makings of a serialist on the level of a Ted Bundy. Let that sink in for a second. This guy, if he is our guy, if not found is the type who would likely have continued following his violent impulses. To me, for some reason, that makes things about this crime all the worse, more horrifying, more the stuff of real-life nightmares. Note that BK is scheduled to attend an extradition hearing on Tuesday, January 2nd, 2023. However, according to his public defense attorney, Jason Labar, BK intends to waive that hearing to expedite his transport back to Idaho. Labar told CNN that BK is eager to be exonerated of these charges and looks forward to resolving these matters as promptly as possible. Okay, BK, you do you. Such confidence for a guy whose DNA has, per the Moscow police, been connected to the crime scene and who drives a white Elantra, the same vehicle the police said was seen near the scene of the crime on November 13th of 2022. It was at his parents' home in the Poconos region of Pennsylvania that the six-foot-tall, 185-pound BK was jarred out of sleep on Friday, December 30th, by a 3 a.m. raid carried out by a team of law enforcement officials. A broken window in the home's front door likely attests to the ambush. It was likely not a coincidence that the officers chose that pre-dawn hour to rip their suspect from his slumber and warm bed. Did they want to give him a taste of the terror he allegedly imposed on Ethan, Zanna, Maddie, and Kaylee on that early Sunday morning in mid-November between 3 a.m. and 4 a.m.? I think so. It was BK's father, Michael, who opened the door, and officials are saying both Michael and his son, Brian, were cooperative. Before I talk more about BK, let me just say that he's innocent until proven guilty. So by talking about him, I'm not saying that he's guilty of this brutal crime. At this time, he is presumed innocent. But at the same time, law enforcement found enough probable cause to get an arrest warrant for him. With that said, let me share the latest details that have come out in the media about BK and his arrest. 
It turns out that his father, Michael, had flown out to Washington in mid-December so that he and his son could make the cross-country drive in Brian's white Elantra to Pennsylvania for the holidays. They would have left Washington after Brian completed his final exams at Washington State University in Pullman, where he was studying for his Ph.D. in the Department of Criminal Justice and Criminology. According to BK's newly assigned public defender, Jason Labar, father and son arrived in Pennsylvania around December 17th. Labar also confirmed to CNN that Brian's white Elantra was found parked at his parents' house, unbeknownst to Brian and his dad, an FBI surveillance team had been tracking them for four days prior to the arrest. As the team kept close watch on the white Elantra as it traversed the highways and byways from the West Coast to the East Coast, law enforcement was busy working with prosecutors to develop enough probable cause to obtain an arrest warrant. Genetic genealogy techniques eventually connected Brian Koberger to unidentified DNA evidence that was found at the crime scene. That DNA had been run through a public database where potential family members were found. Thanks to those matches and subsequent investigative work by law enforcement, Brian's name rose to the surface. His ownership of a white Hyundai Elantra sealed the deal. According to Labar, Brian is currently in a cell alone and is on 24-hour watch by the guards to ensure his safety. In his mugshot, Brian Koberger is seen wearing what's known in prison jargon as a turtle suit. That suit is designed to prevent people from unaliving themselves. I can't say that S word on YouTube. Labar told CNN that he spoke to Brian Koberger for around an hour on Friday night after his arrest to discuss where he was at the time of the Blitz-style attack on the four students. Labar also spoke to Koberger's family Friday night for about 15 to 20 minutes. Labar described Brian Koberger as being shocked a little bit, and he said his parents are also very shocked and that they told him this was out of character for their son. That vague statement is open to interpretation. Did they mean it's out of character for their son to potentially have done in for human beings? I don't know. I mean, I think most parents would probably say that, right? Labar went on to tell CNN, and I quote, we don't really know much about the case. I don't have any affidavit or probable cause. I didn't want to discuss the case with him because I'm merely his representation for this procedural issue as to whether or not he wants to be extradited back to Idaho, end quote. Labar then described Brian's upcoming extradition hearing on Tuesday as a formality proceeding and said all the Commonwealth needs to prove is that his client resembles or is the person on the arrest warrant and that he was in the area at the time of the crime. Labar is quoted as then saying this, knowing, of course, that it's likely they have location data from his cell phone already putting him on the border of Washington and Idaho it was an easy decision, obviously, since he doesn't contest that he is Brian Koberger, end quote. So it sounds like Brian Koberger's cell phone did indicate that he was in the area of the border between the two states when the four students were harmed. I'm not sure if Labar is saying that this means Brian Koberger was near the crime scene, from 3 a.m. to 4 a.m. on November 13th, or if he's simply acknowledging that Brian lives in the city of Pullman, which is only about nine miles from the crime scene. So, of course, tracking data from his phone would have placed him in that general vicinity. It's hard to believe a graduate student of criminology who made a post on Reddit months ago seeking study participants for a research project 
to understand how emotions and psychological traits influence decision-making when committing crimes, would have taken his cell phone with him to Moscow on the night of the crime. So did he have the phone on but leave it at his apartment in Pullman, Washington? And is that what Labar is acknowledging? Or did he mean that Brian Koberger had the phone in the Elantra with him on Sunday and that the digital data shows Brian in Moscow, Idaho, near the crime scene? I'm not sure. It'll be interesting to see what the digital evidence really shows. The primary discussions right now on YouTube post Koberger's arrest are about what this 28-year-old with the cold blank stare was like as a child, how he changed between his junior year and senior year in high school, a time when he lost a ton of weight, allegedly got addicted to heroin, and turned from an overweight kid who was mercilessly bullied into a lean, mean bully himself. At some point, he took up kickboxing and suddenly wanted to fight everyone and anyone. One friend talked about how Brian changed from being a fun friend into an aggressive, mean-spirited guy who would subject his friends to insults. The friend alleges that Brian Koberger told him he was not too bright. BK even allegedly tried to make a bid to steal one of his friend's girlfriends. It was because of BK's sudden personality shift that his friends basically cast him out of their clique. More and more, it's sounding like this is a classic case of an overweight kid whose family experienced major financial problems, such as a bankruptcy the year Brian was born and another when he was a teenager. The second bankruptcy saw the family lose their home and have the family car repoed. That would have been so traumatic, especially for a teenager who's trying to find his place in the social order at school. As a young child, being subjected to bullying for his weight and appearance, maybe even shunned for those qualities by the other kids, can turn a happy kid who thinks he's the cat's meow into a miserable, suffering one who now feels rejected and who begins questioning his self-worth. All of this can lead to a lifelong struggle for self-esteem. We know that. Anyone who's been bullied can attest to that. And if you're bullied and rejected long enough, it can turn into anger and rage. We saw that with Elliot Roger, who ended up going on a crime spree in which seven people died, six that Elliot did in, and he himself was the seventh victim. Factor in the shame, humiliation, and fear that come from being booted from the family home when it probably feels like the whole world is watching and all this can spell major trauma for a child. To lose your family home is to lose your terra firma. This could lead to the child feeling that his world is unstable and chaotic. Suddenly, the two people you thought would keep you safe in a warm, dependable shelter, mom and dad, are no longer invincible and flawless. Now, you have a child who maybe sees the world as a scary, unpredictable place filled with mean people. I'm not saying this to excuse Brian Koberger, by the way. I'm just trying to understand how a human being can allegedly turn into a cold-blooded blank who grabs a sharp-edged object and does what he allegedly did. As an adult, Koberger doesn't sound like he fared any better with his classmates and people in general. We heard from 34-year-old Jordan Sorolnik, who owns the Seven Sirens Brewing Company in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, that Koberger was known for making inappropriate comments to female customers and staff. That business has a system that allows staff to add notes to customers' profiles when their IDs are scanned. After Sorolnik read what his staff wrote about Brian Koberger, namely that he made creepy comments and that after two to three beers, 
he gets just a little too comfortable. So Rolnick decided to confront Brian. He said that he went up to Brian and said, Hey, Brian, welcome back. We appreciate you coming back. I just wanted to talk to you real quick and make sure that you're going to be respectful this time and we're not going to have any issues, end quote. Apparently, Brian was completely taken aback and replied, I don't know what you're talking about. You totally have me confused, end quote. Mr. Sorelnik also stated that Brian would become upset if women rejected his romantic advances. He even called a staff member the B-word. BK never returned to the business. So clearly Brian Kohlberger either doesn't remember his alleged bad behavior or he doesn't see how his words and actions are offensive, as if he has no clue about his ill behavior and how it could turn women off. Other former friends describe Brian as academically gifted and at times socially awkward. One high school friend named Sarah Healy told Fox News Digital the following, and I quote, There was definitely something off about him. Like, we couldn't tell exactly what it was. I remember one time when I was walking in the hallway, and he stopped me and was like, do you want to hang out? But Brian was bullied a lot, and I never got a chance to say something to defend him because he would always run away. End quote. Ms. Healy also said that Koberger was often rejected and bullied by females, leading her to believe it was that internal frustration that ultimately led to his alleged involvement in the Moscow crime. Fellow grad students at Washington State University say that Koberger in his first semester at the school, which he just completed, made offensive comments regarding those in the LGBTQ community, which led him to be pretty much iced out of any social gatherings, despite him appearing to want to be included. So we have women finding him creepy, or the things he says creepy, and we also have him wanting to be included in social gatherings, but finding himself excluded. Koberger himself also shed some light on his personality. His favorite quote, which was included in his profile on Washington State University's website, is from Aristotle. The quote reads, It is the mark of an educated mind to be able to entertain a thought without accepting it. End quote. Does this quote indicate that perhaps Brian Koberger was having dark thoughts, thoughts that he didn't want to accept? Whoever committed the crime in Moscow clearly suffers from violent thoughts and impulses, both of which he failed to control on November 13th. Did Koberger go into the field of criminal justice and criminology not to learn the tricks of the serialist trade, but instead in a bid to better understand himself, to try and find ways to control his violent thoughts, impulses, and fantasies, things that might have been plaguing his mind? Was he smart enough to recognize his very dangerous, dark side, his shadow side? And did he want to escape that dark side? When I first learned of his arrest and his background, I immediately thought he was studying criminology to become a better criminal. And I do think that's part of his fascination with this. But is it possible that there was a small part of him that wanted to learn ways to try and stop himself from following through with any such thoughts? I think there might be. Many of us who are interested in finding out what drives a person to commit such evil acts are trying to decide if Kohlberger might be a psychopath or a sociopath or something else. We're asking ourselves, was he a bad seed from the womb? Or did his life experiences turn him into a potentially dangerous human being? To help me decide if either of these monikers fit what we know so far about Brian Koberger, I read a bunch of different articles. By the way, just for the record, 
Sociopath and psychopath are not terms you'll find in the Mental Health Official Handbook, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, 5th edition. It turns out that doctors don't officially diagnose people as psychopaths or sociopaths anymore. Instead, they use the term antisocial personality disorder for both of these. The acronym for antisocial disorder is ASPD. So while the term sociopath and psychopath may be used by us lay people, they are not clinical diagnoses that doctors use. With that out of the way, let me describe the differences between a sociopath and a psychopath just for the record to help us all better understand what it means when we toss out those terms into the universe. From what I read, sociopaths and psychopaths share a similar set of traits. People suffering from antisocial personality disorder in general have a poor inner sense of right and wrong. They also can't seem to understand or share another person's feelings. The difference between the two, from what I can tell, is that a sociopath typically has a conscience, but it's a weak conscience. A psychopath, on the other hand, has no conscience, no guilt, no sense of remorse, no empathy. According to mayoclinic.org, antisocial personality disorder is a mental disorder in which a person consistently shows no regard for right or wrong and ignores the rights and feelings of others. People with ASPD tend to antagonize, manipulate, and or treat others harshly with callous indifference. They show no guilt or remorse for their behavior or little of it. The article on mayoclinic.org also stated that individuals with antisocial personality disorder often violate the law and become criminals. They may also lie, behave violently or impulsively, and have problems with drug and alcohol use. Other signs of ASPD include poor or abusive relationships, failure to consider the negative consequences of behavior, or to learn from them, being consistently irresponsible and repeatedly failing to fulfill work or financial obligations. And apparently adults with antisocial disorder typically show symptoms of something else called conduct disorder before the age of 15. The signs of this conduct disorder include aggression toward people or animals, destruction of property, deceitfulness, theft, and serious violation of rules. It sounds like Brian Koberger's personality changed around age 14. That's when he lost the weight, allegedly got addicted to heroin, and became aggressive. According to mayoclinic.org, personality forms during childhood and is shaped through an interaction of inherited tendencies and environmental factors, so nature versus nurture. And while the exact cause of antisocial personality disorder isn't known, genes may make a person vulnerable to developing antisocial personality disorder, and life situations may trigger the development of the disorder. Changes in the way the brain functions may have resulted during brain development. Some of the risk factors for developing antisocial personality disorder are being subjected to abuse or neglect during childhood, unstable, violent, or chaotic family life during childhood, and a family history of ASPD or other personality disorders or mental health disorders. As far as a sociopath versus a psychopath, Dr. Bethany Juby, a licensed clinical psychologist, says in her article what it actually means to be a sociopath. 
that there is no actual difference between sociopathy and psychopathy in a clinical context. Instead, the terms psychopath and sociopath offer two slightly different ways of understanding the underlying diagnosis of ASPD. According to an article published by the U.S. National Library of Medicine, psychopathy is a neuropsychiatric disorder characterized by a multitude of behavioral abnormalities, including a lack of empathy, deficient emotional responses, and poor behavioral controls. In the past, psychopathy was viewed as a term describing broadly anyone who violated legal or moral expectations or as a synonym for aggressive and irresponsible behavior. Sociopathy, on the other hand, according to Mayo Clinic, is a mental disorder in which a person consistently shows no regard for right or wrong and ignores the rights and feelings of others. The behavior of sociopaths is typically more impulsive and unpredictable than that of psychopaths. The reason psychopathy and sociopathy are differentiated by some is due to studies that indicate that sociopaths are typically produced by their environment, whereas psychopaths are typically born with antisocial personality disorder due to genetic predispositions. And according to psychologist Robert Hare, and I quote, people with sociopathy have little empathy and a habit of rationalizing their actions, but they typically understand the difference between right and wrong, end quote. Psychopaths, on the other hand, are said to have no sense of morality or empathy. Another expert named Leila Hamoud, who studied psychology at the American University of Beirut, says that not all people with psychopathy or sociopathy are necessarily bad people. She said, and I quote, a psychopath of the highest order is unfeeling, unempathetic, and narcissistic, but all that doesn't stop them from also being intelligent and charming with a high moral compass. Therefore, some psychopaths are actually very good people. They just don't feel and think about things the way most of us do, end quote. Ugh. So at the end of the day, I'm still on the fence as to whether Brian Koberger, who Moscow Police Chief James Fry says he believes is definitely the person responsible for the crime in Moscow, is a sociopath or a psychopath. But it would appear, from all that we've heard about him, from friends and acquaintances, that Koberger is intelligent and knows it, has suffered from bullying in the past, but has also been a bully, may carry around some self-esteem issues that have led him to be rather OCD about what he eats and maybe also about his weight, has had trouble fitting into peer groups, and has been shunned at times, morphed at one point into an aggressive person, has had serious substance abuse issues in the past, has behaved in ways that women find creepy, and seems to lack the awareness of how his behavior is perceived or simply doesn't care and will not cop to it when confronted. Perhaps this is why he allegedly told his public defense attorney that he's looking forward to being exonerated. Maybe if Koberger really is the person who committed this crime, in his mind he still thinks he can get away with it. Until the next time on Bed Crime Stories. Hey, do me a favor, smash that like button. It can help me so much.